In October 1857, British citizen Charles McKay left London for North America and an extensive tour of the U.S. and Canada. During a stop in Alabama, he saw the elegant steamship Eliza Battle moored on a landing along the Tom Bigby River. Its size and grandeur made a strong impression on McKay. That's why, just days later, he was shocked to learn that the side-wheeled paddle steamer had burned, killing many passengers and crew in the inferno or forcing them to freeze to death in the icy river water. It was, at the time, one of the largest losses of life on a United States river. Some residents of Nanfalia, Alabama, say that they, on a quiet night, still hear those screams today. Whether it's history, crime, or legend, Stephanie Hoover has that story. The Eliza Battle was built in New Albany, Indiana in 1852. She had a tonnage or carrying capacity of 316 tons. In 1854, a reception for President Millard Fillmore was held on board the sophisticated ship and festivities included a live jazz band. On a fine day, the sights along the steamer's journey from Columbus, Mississippi to Mobile, Alabama were breathtaking. The Tom Bigby's river's banks, rich with limestone, were white and high. Long strands of white moss dangled from tree branches. Abundant clusters of mistletoe took up residence in host trees along the river, their pearly berries glittering in the sun. Early on the morning of March 1, 1858, however, the Eliza Battle would see her last voyage. Between afternoon and evening, temperatures fell 40 degrees. A strong norther wind made steering the ship difficult. Nonetheless, it left Demopolis, Alabama, carrying a crew of 45, 60 passengers, and anywhere from 1,200 to 1,400 bales of cotton, depending on the account. The Eliza Battle had faced trouble before, even a previous fire, so the captain was certain they could overcome this storm as well. Sadly, though, the steamer had run out of luck. An hour or two before midnight, passengers heard the cry most feared. Fire! Most were in their nightclothes, insignificant protection against the intense cold that immediately froze water to the decks and formed icicles on the paddle wheels. How the blaze started, no one knew or had time to ponder. What was evident was that the bales of cotton had ignited and flames were rapidly leaping from one to the next thanks to the heavy winds. Mothers and children moved toward the deck rails in panic. There was no accessing the life rafts, the fire had seen to that. Quick thinking men threw as yet unignited cotton bales into the water urging loved ones and strangers alike to use them as rafts. Captain S. Graham Stone recommended the opposite. He told passengers to remain aboard rather than brave the freezing Tom Bigby River. He would, said Stone, navigate toward the riverbank where they could deboard safely. But the water was high, the banks swollen, and the current swift. Stone had to fight to reach the shore. Finally, the ship came to rest at Kemp's Landing near the modern Route 114 bridge that crosses the Tom Bigby. But there was yet another problem. The tall steamship aligned with the trees rather than the land. Passengers and crew struggled to grasp onto any limb within reach. Hypothermia made it impossible for most to hang on for very long. Some tied themselves to branches using any means available, handkerchiefs, suspenders, belts, cravats, Mothers bound themselves to their sons and daughters and then to branches to prevent them from falling into the river. Men, women, and children hung in the trees like bizarre human fruit waiting for rescue until, one by one, many died in place or dropped into the frigid depths. Upon hearing word of the fire, local residents ran to the rescue. Many accepted these distressed strangers into their home without question or hesitation. 
Another steamer, the Magnolia, retrieved those poor souls who had chosen to take their chances in the water. Charles McKay, who was writing about his tour for a newspaper back home in England, reported that 28 of those who took refuge in the trees perished. The actual number of deaths on and off the ship varies according to source. Some say 33 died in total. Others put the figure in the 40s, although this is unlikely considering the number of people on board compared to the number of survivors. Several bodies were simply never found. Stories abound of courage and selflessness during the catastrophe. Dr. S.W. Clanton, an Alabama native and a respected man in his field, tied a female friend to a tree limb and then wrapped his coats around her as further protection. He succeeded in fastening himself to a branch as well, but to no avail. Both were found frozen to death. One husband managed to hoist a cotton bale overboard and succeeded in placing his wife and child on top of it. Not wanting to capsize them, he jumped into the river, hoping they would all make it to shore. His family survived. He perished. Captain Stone, his son Frank Singleton Stone, and other crew members were commended for their bravery in assisting passengers before being the last to leave the ship. Today, the Eliza Battle sits in two large, decaying chunks, 28 feet deep on the floor of the Tom Bigby. Or does she? Scores of witnesses tell of a burning ghost ship desperately attempting safe landing on the Tom Bigby Riverbank. Some have described hearing screams of terror and pleas for rescue. Is it the crew and passengers of the Eliza Battle were living that night of horror? Or do these events live only in the vivid imaginations of sympathetic persons who've heard the tale? I don't know what's true and what's folklore, but I know this. I'll be listening and watching the next time I cross the Route 114 bridge between the Alabama towns of Pennington and Nanfalia. Well, that's my story about the sinking of the ghost ship Eliza Battle part two of my six-part Halloween celebration. Do you believe her passengers are doomed to relive their terrifying last moments over and over again? Or are these tales pure bunk? Text me at 717-902-9291 to share your thoughts. Thanks to all of you, this podcast, Stephanie Hoover Has That Story, is growing. I'm honored that so many of you choose to spend a little time with me each week. As you know, my show is not sponsor-supported. I don't run intrusive ads or contests. I just tell the story. If you'd like to support the podcast, I ask this simple favor. Please hit the subscribe button on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever your preferred platform might be. And maybe even visit my website, stephaniehoover.com, and check out my books. Perhaps one of them might be of interest to you as well. If you purchase a book through my site, I earn a small commission at no extra cost to you. This is Stephanie Hoover signing off and reminding you, it's a crazy world out there. So until next time, be well, be happy, and be kind.